Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Professor Anthony Woodman and I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at the University of West London. This evening we're in for a real treat. We'll be hearing from three of the top people at Brentford Football Club and about how they have created an amazing Premier League football team. It's a delight to be coming live from the University of West London where we're joined by a whole range of people from the UWL community, students, staff, businesses, and local residents. But I must say, above all, it's great to be back in person. That said, yeah, oh, come on, a bit more of that, a bit more of that, that's fine, yeah, audience participation works for me. That said, the last couple of years have also made us innovate. And so our friends and stakeholders we're able to reach in a number of other ways. And so it's brilliant that tonight we have hundreds of you joining us online. Whether you're joining virtually or whether you're here in person, and I think I need to make sure that people listen to this one because they seem quite rowdy, I think, your comments and questions need to go into the comments section on YouTube or Facebook. And I will try to read a selection of those out as we go along. And actually, if you can see I'm struggling a bit, Please send me some questions to get me through. Really would be appreciated. Anyway, let's move forward. I'm sure to many of you, the 22nd of November, 1986, has limited meaning. Just checking it doesn't have any meaning. No, no, fine. Good. Okay, on that Saturday afternoon, a fresh young lad recently moved to West London after three years in Sunderland. Watch Brentford draw one all in a Division Three match against Blackpool. Now, he, along with 4,000 or so other people in Griffin Park on that day, didn't think of a new stadium and certainly were not dreaming of top-flight football. If only I had known that I would still be watching the Bees and they would be in top-flight top football, Mind you, there are many other things that I wish I uh, had known then that I know now. Anyway, let's move on. So I'd like to be able to welcome individually each of our guests who are granting our dreams and more. And first off, I'd like to invite John Varney, Chief Executive of Brentford Football Club. <laughs> Brilliant, John. Yes, fine, perfect. Now, John joined in 2019. It's absolutely no surprise to me as to why John was appointed. What a CV. Just give me a little bit of this. I mean, this, this man's got the right pedigree. Rugby Football Union. I know the ball's a different shape, but, you know, there's something in there. Managing Coca-Cola Football Sponsorship, EFL Cup, SFL Cup, and their involvement in Euro 96. No, I won't sing. It's coming home. Nine years at Premiership Rugby, responsible for organisations' income, income streams at a time when that was really evolving. And as a founding partner of Pitch International Commercial, working with football, rugby, cricket federations to, again, develop commercial strategies. All of that's impressive. But I suspect what was the final part and is the final part of the jigsaw, there is a passion from being a local lad and being a lifelong Bees fan. Welcome this evening, John. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Phil Giles. Or rather, I'll let, I'll let, I'll let the man come in the room. <laughs> good CV. That's good CV. Isn't Cheers, it? Phil. Good. Or rather, as I should say, as we are in a university setting, Dr. Phil Giles. I was quite surprised that we hadn't got the title on there. But there we are, Dr. Phil Giles, Director of Football, and has been with the Bees since 2015. Now, as I say, Phil is, has got a PhD, got a doctorate in statistics, which is really good. But there was one slight problem with his doctorate in statistics. He did it at the University of Newcastle. I'll, I'll brush over, having fed the fact that I was in Sunderland for three years. So, yeah, we'll brush over quickly. Northeast rivalries, you don't want to go there. And you don't know who's watching online, so I will move quickly. <laughs> But what I find really fascinating, as we in the university are more and more around data, it just shows how understanding the complex data behind a club is so important. 
And I'm really looking forward to tonight to get more of an insight from Phil around that. But, you know, he came with such a strong pedigree, 10 odd years of working around data analytics in, in, in sports, uh, around particularly in, in, in football, and how that has an impact on, on the financial returns that can come out of football. But the interesting thing, and we just joked about it before, because I think John said, well, hold on, you're wearing this gear. I'm sure many of you have seen a recent uh, uh, interview there where Phil describes himself as the chief executive training ground. So that's why we went, we went with the outfit. We got works perfectly. And I think that's an interesting bit, and I want to be able to tease more of that. So again, welcome, Phil, this evening. I thought I was on the news for a minute then. I thought, no, no, that's great. I thought I'd really made it. Um, that, that was hold Thomas. On. He can't make it this evening. He can't make so. it. I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Is that just because I shout too loud? I anyway, didn't deal with that. And finally, Thomas Frank. Go on in, Thomas. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Now, you don't really need an intro to Thomas, do you? Because we've all seen Thomas on the touchline. Uh, and even those, those of you who may not have been able to get down to the great stadium, uh, will have seen him on Match of the Day or, or when, when it's a, a Sky game. So he's very recognisable, a real visible face to the ecosystem that we're going to hear about tonight. Now, as a result of experiences around international coaching, combined with the absolutely incredible work that Thomas has done at Brentford, it's not surprising he's now one of the best regarded coaches in the world. However... We have met several times, including we had a very enjoyable meal together in Pillar's Restaurant one, one, one evening. And we've talked about a few things. And I was aware that Thomas had a degree in sports education. But what I didn't know, wonders of Wikipedia, I tell you, is that actually he's done some lecturing. So I've decided that as we're the career university, we're always interested in taking on really good, high quality lecturers. So do you know what? If you want to career change, after Brentford have won the Champions League, can we have a chat, Thomas? That would no work problem. well. No problem. Welcome again this yeah. evening, Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, let's get on why you've come here. Um, we want to have a look under the bonnet of Brentford Football Club. And so I want to start by looking, and I'm going to go, go, go with, with a series of questions about those foundations for why we're having the brilliant success we have now. So, John, can I, can I come to you? And, you know... Brentford has sort of found success and are renowned for doing things just that little bit differently compared to other football clubs. So as, as chief exec, you know, what's your approach to the way the club is, is run and, and the success that comes from it? I think some people read a little bit too much into it. And I think from our side, it's, um, it's about having a very clear strategy. It's about setting your, your goals. Um, creating that strategy so that you can enable you to reach those goals. And it's about making lots of good little decisions. Um, and it's also about being confident um, and confident that you can achieve your goals, but, but remaining very humble at the same time. So, you know, I think lots of people try and make it out to be something it isn't. It's, it's really about um, executing a really good plan yeah. and surrounding your, your business with great people that will work hard, very dedicated, and um, will go that extra mile. There was one thing you said in there, John, that actually reinforces why Brentford is different. You used the word humble. And I think for me, someone, you know, we, 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 we've been associated with the club for some time, was that was always the worry, that when success came, there wasn't that. We still feel it, and I'm sure many, many fans. So I think that is so, so key with what you said. So, so thanks for sharing that. Um, and really links on to the second question I want to ask was, was like yourselves, we know working with artists and fan bases, but working with the community is so, so important. Um, for you in Brentford, you know, how, how much does that humble, that ethos depend on being community? I mean, the name of the stadium for a start gives it away, but you know, any more sort of thoughts around that? Community is everything to us. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the move to the new stadium has been a long, long time in the making. Absolutely. Uh, there was lots of chat many years ago about moving the, the venue out to Western International by Heathrow Airport. Mm. I think there was a plan once upon a time that they looked at Woking. Um, but for us, it was really about staying in the heart of our community. Um, you know, and, and we are surrounded with 
probably one of the most diverse communities in London. Um, you know, with, with Ealing on our doorstep, London Borough of Hounslow, um, some more affluent boroughs around in terms of uh, Richmond and Kingston. So, um, you know, communities is hugely important. And it's not just about the community, it's the, it's the way that we behave as a club and an organisation. And, and we, have, we have three core values in our, in our business, and um, it's togetherness, respectful and progressive. And um, the respectful piece plays very much to our, our, our beginnings in the community. And if it wasn't for our community, this football club wouldn't be in existence. You know, when we were going through some pretty, pretty torrid times pre-Matthew's arrival, um, it was our fans that kept our football club going. Um, and then they've got to a point where, obviously, the, the fans were looking for investment and, and Matthew being a supporter of Brentford and a lifelong fan came on board. And, um, and that's why we retain that golden share for our fans on the board. So community is absolutely everything. And again, I think that reinforces that little bit of difference with Brentford, that that is really there. And I can see the real passion in, in that being important for how you do. It doesn't matter that where you are now in the Premier League, you've still got that. And that's brilliant. So, so thanks for that, job. So what I'd like to do is now move to, to Phil, because actually you've already sort of alluded to the, the time when Matthew joined and some changes. And also that very much linked to a lot of what we hear about the role of data within what goes on at the club. Um, and I'm just really interested to get a bit more of an insight. What does that actually mean in the sense of how do you use data in terms of what you do at Brentford? <clears throat> yeah, so I came in in 2015, and uh, yeah. I think there was a, 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 a sort of media announcement around that time when I did that, when I came in, that um, we'd be using data more for, for you know, recruitment by certain yeah. players, um, which we do, but actually it's much, much broader than that. I think it's the bit that's you know called the money ball bit, and we try and not get too associated with that because it's quite different. Yeah. But I think the key key use of it for me, and probably for Thomas as well, is in actually just the day to day running of the club, but also the football department. So, to give an example, um, every Monday morning, I have a spreadsheet email to you, an email to you as well, with uh, you know we, we try and measure how we're playing, not just in one game but over a period of time. Yeah. And that allows us to, um, you know, assess how we're setting up against the targets that we set ourselves at the start of the season, where we wanted to improve, where we thought we could be better as a team, but also to ask meaningful questions, you know, for, for us to sit in a room and ask genuinely insightful questions about, you know, are we any good? At, we think we're good at this, but if you don't have some sort of measurement, you know, we think we're a good, we think we're an organised team, we think we're good at pressing, we think we're good at set pieces, but actually unless you measure it, you don't really know and sort of benchmark yourself and um, and then you can start to, to grow from that point. So instead of just saying we want to be better next year, we can start to break it down and say how are we going to be better yeah. next year. No, that's, that's really weird. And actually that looks quite nicely. I'm starting, I was about to say, are we going to get any other questions? Because that links quite nicely to something that's just come in, if I can dig this out quite nicely. Yeah, so... And it links to what I'm going to come on to in a moment. It said, Patrick says, has the rise of Brentford up the football ladder led to changes in the approach to recruiting? And, you know, you've talked about that. Have you, are you seeing any changes in how the use of, you said it's not just about recruitment, but, but that side of things? Um, well, the process has evolved over time. I wouldn't say that the jump to the Premier League has changed our approach. per no. say, obviously, we've learned and we've adapted and we've made mistakes and we've tried to correct it. Um, the, you know, the, I think the higher up you go, the the smaller the pool of talent, actually. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I can really imagine that. Improve you anyway. So, so you're fishing in smaller and smaller pools. So, you know, if you're a very, very top side, you, you know, if you're Man City, there's only a handful of players really who can go and improve Man City. And you don't yeah. necessarily need a big data set. The lower down you are, you've got a, a wider, maybe, you know, set of players who can come and improve you. And maybe using data maybe helps you to filter that down a little yeah. bit, bit okay. easier. But I wouldn't say there's been any dramatic changes no, okay. by being promoted. Okay, okay. Which then does link to, and you know, there's been, been a bit of talk about, there's been talk about Brentford bringing back the academy in response to Brexit, for example. You know, is that, again, just part of this general, you've got a flexible approach that allows you to alter your strategy accordingly? It has to always be a flexible approach. There's no fundamental kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, aversion to having an academy. You always review it year on no. year. Things change over time as well. Um, so a couple of examples of things that I think one is in the championship, 
we weren't really thinking about playing European football. No. Obviously, where we are now, it's not a massive leap to think no. about getting there. In order to do that, we need a UEFA license. In order to have that, we need an academy or some sort of youth development yeah. policy yeah. set up. And you mentioned Brexit, and that was obviously a key thing as well. Yeah. It meant that now we can't go to Europe and take players who are under 18 no. or English clubs have that, that uh, restriction. So um, if we can't do that, we have players like Mads Rysler, Mads Beck Sorensen, who came from Denmark, yeah. are now closed off. So we need to rethink that a little bit as well. Okay. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting to see. Thank, thanks for that. Um, Thomas, I mean, it sort of links to some of what we've been talking about and the general ethos. So you joined in 2016. How important was the wider philosophy and strategy in, just, in you know, making you go, actually, Brentford's where I, where I want to come? Because many might have said, why Brentford with, with what you'd already been doing? Good question. Um, now, um, I, one of the reasons um, was that, of course, I could see the alignment from um, top to bottom um, was, was very clear. And I think that's, that's key if you want to have success in any, any yeah. business. Um, so clear, clear alignment from Matthew, two sports directors at that time, yeah. um, Phil Erasmus all the way down. Um, and I could see the, the philosophy of the, the way he wanted to play was also yeah. how I saw the game. Um, and I, I was uh, giving the, the previous role to try to, um, um, how can you say, uh, develop that area yeah. um, and put it down in, 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 in writing how we want to do it and try to do it exactly in drills and everything and uh, we tried to integrate that so I did that together with the, the two other coaches at that time, Dean and, yeah. and, and, and Richard. Um, so, yeah, it was actually relatively okay. easy to say yes. Okay, no, that's, that, that's good because what's, what's, what's really interesting and it sounds like there were elements that there was that clear strategy to get to where we are now and there sounds like there's been enough flexibility that, yeah, you didn't have a single path and I'm going to come and revisit some of that, say some of the the traumas when perhaps promotion didn't come the first time round and how you responded. But certainly that sounds like it was good, solid. Yeah, from quite early on, you knew where you were going. That feels like it's coming through, which is, which is good. So what I'm going to go to is the one that was the obvious question out of all this was going to come. So I'm going to get this one out of the way early on. It's going to be about Christian Eriksen. It's going to have to be. You know, I mean, I've just got to put that one in because otherwise someone's going to... I'm going to have how many going, you've not asked Thomas about this. So, you know, Christian has, you know, Everyone knows made a huge impact in the in the in the last few matches. How did you get him to come to Brentford? Hi, Christian. How are you? Uh, I'm good, thank you. You want to come play for Brentford? Yeah. You know what? I thought about calling you. Oh, easy done. Bill, over to you. Now, you see, I like that. So we've talked a bit about data and all of this. Good old-fashioned dog and bone does the trick. I called him, and of course, yeah. uh, um, it was a plus that I knew him from before. So we had a a chat about life that you know literally uh, yeah, yeah. was yeah. relatively important for everyone, so, especially him. And and after that, and I yeah, I asked him that question: what, what is he? What is he thinking? Could he yeah. see himself in, in Brentford? And he yeah. said, "Thomas, I actually thought about calling you." So we were okay. in a pretty good uh, position yeah, there. Good. Uh, of course, it was always going back and forth. We are very pleased that he's playing for us. I think it's, in many ways, it's a miracle that he's in Brentford. In many ways, it's a miracle yeah. that he's alive. Absolutely. And that's the most important thing. We are pleased yeah, absolutely. that, you know, he's playing for our team, our club. Um, and now the big task is, of course, to try to convince him to stay. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So it's quite interesting. So that has sparked a question from a Spurs fan. I don't know how a spur. No, I won't go into after Saturday. Did, did you watch the game on Saturday? I was there on Saturday. Yeah. Which I, one was the better scene? On that I, I think we know, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, we know. That's why I'm surprised a Spurs fan admitted. Exactly. Anyway, Alfie, so now you've even been named. Not only are there. Right. Has Ericsson's return really lifted the team cohesion and spirit at Brentford? And I guess that's coming in. We know, we know Christian's ability. But what about the other side again? And you see where I'm the theme here is to see data is important, but also people are. And, and, and how, how much of a difference does he make in the changing room? First and foremost, I think we need to give a little bit credit to the other players. Yeah, um, that's... There's you know, actually 11 players playing out there. Yeah. And if you played alone, you'll achieve absolutely nothing. nothing. If there are 11 players... Yeah. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah. If there are 11 players, it's, impo impo it's possible to achieve something big. Uh, but obviously, his abilities are, are very big, uh, so he offers some quality that, that we didn't have before. 
Uh, what I think was well, the big reason why we are relatively successful this year is the togetherness and then the structure in the team. Mm -hmm. And when everyone was fit uh, in the beginning <coughs> of the season, we did quite well. So now everyone is fit, fit. more or less, yeah. um, performed well, and then of course added that extra quality. Mm -hmm. And he gives that, you know, always, you know, if I don't know what to do with the ball, you can always pass it to Christian. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty good uh, ability, yeah. ability to have. Yeah. But the, maybe the key thing is that the, um, the personality of Christian is that he actually is bang on in what I, I describe as attitude, yeah. confident but humble. Yeah. So he is very confident, but he's humble. So he's yeah. absolutely a perfect match for our right. culture. Right. And thanks, I think, in the world in which we live for reminding us that indeed football is a game of 11 plus other players. I do sometimes wonder whether that goes away. So I think that's really, really good. I've just got a comment here and I think fits, fits nicely as we, we get to the end of, of this section. So I've got Alan has made a comment here. Supporter of 67 years. His dad took him to matches. He sold programmes sitting on the pitch watching matches. And he just wants to say, I'm so proud to see the bees thriving in the Brentford community. So to me, you know, you should take those, those type of things. I think it comes to this, this great theme of being humble, but being professional and, and having excellence. So yeah, well, well, well done in, in retaining that. Right. I've got one final bit in this section, and I'm very happy who else wants to take it up. So you don't all have to have a go at this one. But we've, we've got a number of our ambitious students, and we've got enterprising businesses from the local community here with us. Looking back over your careers, this is that classic one. You know, what bit of advice are you going to give any of us, perhaps, who are striving to work in organisations, not bad individuals, working in organisations that are going to be high performing? Happy to throw it open to any of you. You guys start, then I finish. <laughs> okay. um, we are in an industry that has got noise everywhere. And so it's so easy to get distracted. And it's about that absolute focus um, and having that clear objective and strategy. Because the minute you get distracted, um, you lose sight of, of the, the, the prize, really. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and also, I think one thing that we're very good at as an organisation is um, knowing what we're all good at and what we're not good at. And um, so we try and get experts around us for those areas that we, we know we would fall short in. So, you know, it's about real honesty um, and real focus for me. That's good. Phil, <clears throat> thoughts? Yeah, I think two things. One is um, in terms of a high-performing environment, uh, looking at the training ground, we don't, we're not a business that makes anything in particular. We don't make the, the product is people. Mm -hmm. So people to us are the most important thing mm -hmm. by, by, by an absolute mile. So at an organizational level, if Thomas surrounds himself with good players, he looks good. If I surround myself by good coaches, I look good. Yep. It's about having just, just almost better people than us around us, mm -hmm. helping us to do the job and, and doing the job themselves, and that's good for everyone. So just top people in terms of um, talent, but also in terms of uh, attitude, ability, and all those important people characteristics is, is massive. It's the most important thing by an absolute mile. Uh, I'll just say from an individual perspective, and my advice to any student from my own career is do what you enjoy, first and foremost. If you enjoy mm -hmm. it, the rest will follow. I just mm -hmm. followed the path of doing things that I thought were interesting and fun, and it led me to this job here, which is a great job for me. Mm -hmm. So that, that, is, that yeah. is key. That's, that's great. Thomas? Uh, bang on. Um, I was thinking about, it's all about people. Yeah. So don't want to say more about that just uh, agree um, second thing work hard yeah no matter what you want to achieve you need to work hard yeah. and maybe work harder than everyone else yeah. if you want to go past someone um, and then talking about people I'm um, a lot of time we're speaking about that and I think it's it's perfect and I have a top story I heard this morning uh, that I'd like to share with you um, so one thing key value togetherness that's you know on and off the pitch, uh, and uh, I always say no dickheads uh, in yeah. terms of uh, players or staff members. I guess a little bit the <coughs> same with um, with you, John. Uh, so good people, but there is a fantastic, nice little story. So we have Alistair. He's working uh, in our recruitment department uh, in uh, you know 
uh, he, he's not the, the person the players know really interact with. You know, he made it seem sometimes having a coffee or tea in the yeah. in the canteen. Um, so um, last week, I think um, he's walking to, to to the train ground every morning. So last week, um, a big car pulled up next to him, and he's like, "Oh, what, what's happening here?" Door opened. He said, "Hey, Elsa, please jump in." That was David Wright. So he just took him and drove him to the train ground. And he was, you know, bossing. He was talking to the guy the head of the um, uh, recruitment thing. It was fantastic. You know, he, he did that to me. And then yeah. um, three days later, yeah. walking to the train ground, another big car pulled up, door open. Christian Eriksen said, hey, Alistair, please come in here. Yeah. I drive him to the train ground. I think that's a fantastic example. And it made me get, you know, goosebumps yeah. that have these highly profiled totally. players. Totally. And I think that's the main reason yeah. why we're good. And I think that's, that's, that, that's great, great to hear. I was going to ask you which part of the road do I need to stand on to get a lift by these <laughs> players. Um, but actually, you know, it's, I think you know, that is what's so true. I mean, even if I, I know ourselves in, in, in UWL, I know if I get told by someone, no, Anthony, that is not where your strength is. It doesn't matter what my role is. Listen to that. And actually, that makes the difference. And I think that's what you're coming through is this humble, but also listening as a senior team that, yeah, you know, there are a number of ways to get there, and that's clearly playing dividends. So thanks ever so much for that. I think I cut to a video now, allegedly, according to my script. Is that correct? Obviously not. Yes. We are a bit different to other Premier League clubs. Thank you. 
me to start. We could have had a few more goals like that. Would have been better for this evening, I think. But I think that captures a lot of what you've said. And then there, you know, it really shows it's authentic with what's, what's happening. So I think we've really got a good sense now of what's underpinning Brentford and how you go forward. So what I'm keen to sort of get an idea of is that, you know, all success doesn't come without challenges. So sort of question to all of you, I'm happy to see, see whoever wants to pick it up. Um, what's the biggest challenge you've ever had to overcome? Not necessarily in the club, just generally, and perhaps that challenge has had a bearing on how you've, you've managed things in recent years. Anyone got any thoughts? Am I going again first? Yeah, let's do this you, you, first. You've got to go first. first. It's not fair. Um, listen, Brentford's been faced with challenges for many, many, many years. It's, it's actually nine years ago today... I believe that we played uh, Doncaster Rovers in the last game of the league oh. season. We get a penalty yep. in the 90th minute. Yep. Loney from Fulham, Marcelo Trotter, yep. steps up to take the penalty, hits the bar, Doncaster break, score. We drop into the playoffs. They get automatic promotion and we lose to Yeovil in the playoff final. So, you know... As a football club, you know, everyone says we're, we're, there's highs and lows. We've had a lot of lows, let me tell you. And, yeah. um, you know, the challenges that we faced um, from decommissioning Griffin Park, mm -hmm. um, then COVID, um, one kick away from promotion against Fulham, um, and then promotion, 29th of May, and then having to start a Premier League season in a matter of two months later, was an enormous effort from everybody at the football club. So it, that was a, a hugely challenging period. And, you know, we talked a lot about that core value of togetherness. And it was really hard to keep everyone together at that point because for obvious reasons, you had a training ground that we were locking down. People were walking around with masks on um, you know, and, and it was the complete opposite of what we're about as an organisation because we want everybody to, to mix and, and, and gel together. So I, I genuinely think that, that that period between promotion, the start of the season, the amount of work that everybody had to go through was certainly the most challenging period of my career. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, I, I remember very, very well that 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 night that we've all just looked at it against Arsenal. Yeah. And that night nearly didn't happen, believe you me. Um, so I got a phone call um, at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I, don't, I didn't even call you, Thomas. I phoned Phil and um, it was Richard Masters, the chief exec of the Premier League. And, and I've looked out of the office and we have got the world's broadcasters there. Cara and Neville were there international broadcasters, media everywhere, you know, biggest, we're, we're opening the Premier League season, our first full stadium uh, in the Premier League. And um, Richard Masters called me, he said, I think we've got a problem. I said, oh dear, what's going on? He said, um, Arsenal have got some COVID in the camp and um, we're going to have to test all their players again to work out whether the game's on this evening. And um, he said, I'll phone you back at three o'clock in the afternoon and let you know how they're getting on. So five past three comes. I've not had a phone call. So I sent him a, a WhatsApp. I said, shall I get the burgers out the freezer? <laughs> and uh, to which he responded, um, not quite yet. I'll let you know in 15 minutes time. And uh, sure as eggs is eggs, he phoned me back in 15 minutes and he said, we're on, and I was so relieved. I can't tell you because uh, you know to have to have not had that night would have would, would have been tragic, absolutely tragic. That sounds uh, yeah. Now you tell us that was a great night, great night. But what you could have spoiled that for us. And if we played Arsenal later on, who knows? So it was great. Um, Actually, I'm happy. Listen, I've got some other questions, so I'll let you off having the, uh, to, to think any more about the challenge. They'll come through anyway. Because um, it, it links a little, little bit to a question, again, I want to come back to this, this data people type bit, bit further. So, Phil, obviously, 
we've just talked there about missing out on promotion there. Um, you know, obviously only a year or so ago, but also sadly I was at that Yeovil thing at Wembley a few years earlier than that. You know, there's been a few of those. How do you then come back the next year in terms of still using all of the information you've got data-wise, but also managing that there is raw emotion there? And it may be a question actually for the two of you, because maybe Thomas will come more with the human perhaps element and with the data. Yeah. How do you pick yourself up again? How do you pick yourself up? And I know you're going to say, but data's not perfect and it's not always, it's sure it isn't. But you know, the data's telling you the one thing, the result was another and you've got humans there pretty upset that it hasn't gone their way. How does that work in the club? <clears throat> yeah, so I, <clears throat> I can tell you myself, because after the uh, playoff final, we lost to Fulham, I went down to just assume myself. And yeah. see everyone's. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and it's, um, <clears throat> my job is, is to always be looking much further ahead than just one game. And, you know, it's obviously it's challenging in that moment to look further ahead than one game. Even, but, uh, even for you, it's difficult that right? Even, yeah. Well, I, I, I did try to be upbeat, but um, and still positive, because I knew, I knew that we'd still have a good chance the next year. I know yeah. it's frustrating, but, yeah, I learned that night that not everyone wants to hear that that night. And uh, <laughs> no. people just wanted to punch me in the face. Absolutely. When I like, Don't worry about yeah. it. It's all no, fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I sat with Pondis for about 20 minutes in the dressing room and um, had a good chat with him, and he... He just wiped me yeah. head down. I realised that I was sitting on his, um, he'd taken his top off, it was all wet and sweaty, and I'd been sitting on it, and I, I, I was all, all wet down No. There. That was probably the worst moment. Actually, yeah, actually, it's worse, worse than missing out horrible. promotion, yeah. I wanted to go home at that point. Yeah. But yeah, but listen, we had, one of the good things about that was, um, you can probably expand on the stories, but we had two weeks off. Ten days. Ten days off? Eight, actually. <laughs> Eight days off. Not that you're bitter about that. No, 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 no. You are not at all. You had three months off with COVID, you did nothing. <laughs> yeah. With the lockdown, um, you know, we, had, we, had eight, we had eight days off and then two weeks training and then back into the new season. Yeah. Uh, we knew we had to sell a couple of players, we knew we had to get one or two in. And that was it. And that's all the big yeah. changes. So actually, in some, some sense, actually, that there wasn't much of a break, but it was good just to yeah. get, you just get back just straight, get straight back to it. You just got to get back up and do it. I mean, what, what else can you do? No, 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 I agree. Things to add. I, um, I, I agree with Phil, of course. That, that, that's the thing. When you're playing two player finals, a little bit easier when you won one of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, then I think it's a, a good experience uh, to have lost the, the first one yeah. because you learn so much um, about yourself and about everything. Uh, we all know that. You learn much more from, uh, from defeats than, than wins. Um, uh, but after that game, of course, that was by far the worst, worst feeling I ever felt yeah. in terms of professional uh, and, and football. And, you know, of course, players were crying, everyone was down, you know, completely flat and devastated. Um, and the, the, the thing was that we had a short meeting the day after the training ground. Uh, we just wanted to, to have everyone in just to say a few bits because, you know, you're not listening after that defeat. Um, so I just said a few things. Okay, go home, relax, uh, take, you know, the, these eight, uh, ten days off. Uh, and then we'll, then we'll go again. Uh, we still have, as you said, uh, a, bit, a good chance. Of course, at that moment, they don't listen. No. Uh, yeah, that, that, that day, you know, Ollie Watkins was crying because he loved Brentford and he didn't want to go. No. But he knew that he probably had to go. Yeah. Uh, we, we, Salid, we were crying like you had to go as well. Yeah, yeah. So, no, we were crying as well. Uh, so, yeah. But I remember we had a recruitment meeting that morning. We should never have done that. But uh, anyway, no. we, we did. It had to happen. Uh, uh, it had to happen. Yeah, I agree. It had to happen. It was not, that's, that was why it was so crazy. Because it needed to be there. We were all you know, splitting up. They were yeah. coming back eight days later. Uh, you try to relax a little bit. You don't because you're constantly on the phone. Because we need to look into the next season. And then we go again. And that season is insane. You said it with COVID. Yeah. Um, at, we are, when we start the season until we played Tottenham in the semi-final in the Carabao Cup. Yeah. We are the team in whole Europe <laughs> that, that played the most matches. Yeah. And that is comparing the biggest Champions League yeah. clubs. And I promise you, we're not flying no. to Manchester. We took the no. bus and yeah. the train or whatever we did, and we had to split up, and we had to go every third day. Yeah. That was insane. Yeah. Uh, but, the big but, you said, I, I also had that. I knew, I knew that we had a good chance. Okay. Uh, because we had a good team. Yeah. Uh, we had to lose the two <coughs> best offensive players in the league. Yeah. We bought one to replace. We tried another one, but we only had really one that really got and, and replaced um, uh, one of them. Uh, so we got Ivan Tony in. 
um, actually got a little bit slow start, but then we started to build, um, and the rest is history. But what was the impact on the morning then of the second? So the next year, when we were up at Wembley, well, you're that's going what there. I was going to say, what? Every cloud has a silver lining, doesn't it? Yeah. And um, you know, lost to Fulham, yeah. devastated. Yeah. Clearly, uh, not ideal for Matthew as well because we just missed out on a huge um, windfall from the land of milk and honey. Um, But um, can you imagine what that season would have been like for our fans that didn't get the chance to say goodbye to Griffin Park and then had a season in the Premier League where they're locked out of the stadiums? It would have been just awful. And the other thing that it made us do is by jingo, did we have one hell of a party after beating uh, yeah, Swansea in the final? That was a very good party, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm not surprised. <laughs> so that was the lesson. We had, a COVID, party in. we had a COVID Mulligan Forest style that night. You did, you did. Okay, we keep actually, we'll we're, we're move on quickly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly on that side of things. But no, that's, that's, that, that, that really is good. What I'm now interested in, I'm going I'm to put this one your way, Thomas. Look. You, we can see you on the touchline. We can see that you, know, you are invested in what's going on, on the pitch. How do you cope personally with the pressures of what you're having during a game when you're still, you know, John talked about decision making, but that's a high power. Your office is high powered, but a very visible office where John and me, I can go to my office and stick my hand in my hands and go, what on earth am I going to do? How do you cope with the pressure of being very visible? Good question. Um, of course, obviously, different games, different pressure. Yeah. So Tottenham game, of course, pressure. We want to win. Uh, you, you feel it in your body. Um, and of course, I try to, to plan uh, the decisions in terms of... Uh, yeah. Of course, the, the main bit of work I've done before the game. So of that's course, relatively yeah, calm and all that. Then I deliver my last final tactical meeting and a, a few little bit motivational um, and then it's about then the next thing is the is the um, at the halftime where I had where I'll have three to five minutes to deliver a message so of course I need to be calm there normally always calm or try to be calm uh, uh, during the first half maybe I'm trying to be animated and shouting is actually just stupid because they can't they can't hear me no. uh, so I try to get my message across but they, 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 they can't hear me so, of course, a few times I can speak to a, a, a couple of the players. So, for me, it's, a, it's about the, um, the substitutions. Yeah. And most of them have planned, um, um, not when, in what minute. No, but if that. we it's going according to plan A, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're winning, then I know, okay, m- most likely these are the three players or whatever. Okay. If it's then a draw and we are going the offensive way, then I know what kind of message. If we're, Achieve. you know, and then defensively, and then I know in, uh, also by planning, if we get an injury there, it will be him. If we get an injury there, it will be him, and, and so on. Okay. Uh, but of course, uh, sometimes it's difficult. I think most, you know, you, you can't do anything. You just stand there. You know, everything is on yeah. on stake, and especially the playoff final. That is horrendous. That is the, no, no, I can imagine that. That's standing good. there, and I look so cool, and inside there's just a hurricane, and my body is burning. And you can't do anything. No, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't get that excitement doing my job. But no, 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 I wish I did yours. This sounds far more interesting. I think I need to cut to another video. When you're winning, yes. When, when you're winning, yeah. yeah. When you yes. No, I can imagine. That's true. Luckily, we win a lot at the University yeah, of West yeah. London. So, yeah, I go with that. Um, I think we need to go to another video.
quite nicely to, as we move to sort of the final part, was I was going to ask, you know, it's been an outstanding season so far, which is a little bit left. Um, what's the highlight? It would be easy to say that one, but I'm sure you're going to say there's a lot more sophistication. That was good night. But, so I'm going to start with you this time, Thomas. It's been, what, what do you, yeah, I'm going to start with you. What has your been, what's been the best moment since we've been in the Premier League? Yeah, I think we've been extremely privileged. I think we're privileged because I think sometimes we know it's, it's, a, it's a marginal game. Um, so I can't remember a season where we have three last-minute winners, um, and then we had in the first season of Premier League, which is crazy. Um, obviously, the Chelsea game as well. Um, I think for me, the most complete performance was home to West Ham, yeah. where I think we controlled them uh, in every aspect of the game, yeah. and they are maybe going to win the Europa League and yeah. coming sixth in the. Premier League, I know it's one sh snapshot, but we try to add a lot of these snapshot, yeah. Yeah. snapshots together and, and, and progress. But it needs to be the Arsenal game yeah, for me. Um, yeah. First game first in game. the new season, Absolutely. worldwide to the whole world, um, and a good performance to <laughs> safely win. Yeah, it, it doesn't get any better. No, I agree. You know, if Brentford, even as the area, comes back to that community bit. I mean, what did that do? I mean, we move on from the bus stop on the way to Hounslow. Right? <laughs> it made Brentford, is, is Brentford what it is? We all know, you know, lots of people in this room have been in the area for years. And I have to say, yeah, that night really yeah. did. Suddenly, not only for the club, but shook the whole area up. So that was great. John, what's, 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 what, what for you? You're going to say no highlights being as a chief exec. It's just nothing but challenges. No, no. Look, I'm a fan first, aren't yeah, I? Absolutely. And, um, Oh, you feel a lot of pain during these games. Yeah. I have that. Yeah. We've had that. You're not good at you. You're the worst, I'm the me. worst yeah, yeah. of the three of us yeah, yeah. during the game. Um, uh, the Arsenal game for, for me, because yeah. uh, and it was probably the proudest moment because yeah. uh, genuinely, I can't tell you the amount of work the staff got through to open that stadium. You know, with all the COVID that went before, the fact that. Um, you know, we, we hadn't loaded the stadium to its full capacity. You know, we'd had the Bournemouth game where I think we had 4,000 in there, even though they made the noise of uh, 17,500. Mm -hmm. But that, that just everything came together that night and, and, it, and it just went off perfectly. You know, so that will stay forever in the memory. I'm going to slightly mix it up for you then, Phil. They've had a couple of highlights. I'm going to say, so based on where we are at the moment, what next? What is, what is the highlight you look forward to creating for the club? I had a highlight as well. I wanted to oh, no, okay. No, do, no, Phil, do your highlight first and then mix it around. I was just trying I'm to mix, mix it, it up it a around, bit. I'm going to mix it around. Okay, so for me, <clears throat> kind of linked to a little bit to the next step, which is I won't pick a game. What I'll pick is I think you talked about a little bit how we came about that sort of process of sending Christian yeah. Eriksson, but ultimately when he says I want to come, is it, it was quite a complicated process. Yeah. It wasn't a simple one. No. <clears throat> and it took till the end of January, and then we got the transfer deadline day. Mm -hmm. On transfer deadline day, we deliberately timed the announcement for 8 a.m. on transfer deadline day, so we were the first deal of the day. Yeah. But we also knew it would go m like mega big global. Yeah. And um, and I think our, the kids were watching Breakfast TV, and it was like kind of breaking news yeah. on Breakfast TV yeah. on BBC so One. So it was like, I think it put the whole club on another level. It did. Which isn't why we signed him. No, no. But it had that knock on implication of putting the club on a whole other level. Sure. sure. And so if you ask me about what next and what, yeah. you know, obviously, yeah. <laughs> so we'd like to keep him. But uh, that's, <laughs> that was but, what, one of the questions someone had asked me about that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, there you go. There's your answer. It would be nice too. Yeah. We don't know the answer to that. But, but the, the key thing is to now cement Brentford on the next level from where we have been. Over the next two or three years now, we talk about league targets, we talk about signing good players, but ultimately the, the profile of the club now is at another level compared to yeah. where it was yeah. months ago. Which actually links, I had a question had come in from uh, one, of, one of the audience and I, I thought I'd keep it quiet, I thought we don't need to sort of swear at an event like this, but was how do you avoid the Sheffield United, the Leeds United, sort of yo-yo-y type risk, risk type thing? How, how is, is there a way? of trying to be able to insulate you against it or 
are those vagaries that we all know about and, and the level of spending in certain clubs mean actually there's limited things you can do? I'll start. Then Phil, Thanks. you'll uh, Thanks. explain even better than me. I think in football, you never know what's going to happen. No. So, so everything can hit you. Injuries, COVID, you know, everything can hit you. But I would be very disappointed if we're in the situation where we're in big trouble next year. So would we. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No. And, uh, and actually, I'd say the Premier League would be poorer for it as well. It's, you know, the type of football you, you play. And I think the ethos we've heard a lot about tonight, we need that in the Premier League. So, you know, we're certainly, certainly with you on that. Um, Phil, any, any other final comments you want to go about the future? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's second season syndrome. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a bit of a narrative around that. There's a few yeah. cases where that's happened, but you know, yeah. there's other teams that have gone on to do well. I think um, Leicester was at their second yeah. or third season yeah. they won the league. After Absolutely. The so yeah, it can go the other way. That, well, right? Spot on. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll go with you on that one because remember, you're getting in Champions League and then I'm having a word about the lecturing. So, you know, let's just go on. <laughs> I've got space at the moment. You know? said win the Champions League, yeah? Yeah, you've got to win the Champions League. Yeah, well, in it, well, if not in it, you can't win it. We're not playing Champions League not to win it. So yeah. it's two years away. So, uh, <laughs> okay, a couple of years. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it, keep it, we'll keep the seat warm for you. John, final thoughts of where, 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 where from here? I just think we've got to keep growing. Um, you know, the guys are doing that on the pitch. <clears throat> I think off the pitch, um, you know, I think we, we want to challenge. Um, we want to uh, do things differently to other clubs. I think, you know, we've made some good inroads this year um, in terms of what we're trying to do from a sustainability perspective. You know, I think we're the first Premier League club to, to decide to roll over their kit. So, you know, that saves money for the fans. Um, and, but we're in a lucky position that we can do that because, you know, our revenues at the moment, compared with some of our competitors in the Premier League, enable us to be, you know, take those risks and where it's not going to hit the bottom line quite so hard. So I, I think genuinely we want to keep growing it. Um, you know, our, our role in the community is, is probably going to help us um, drive our commercial partner program um, but better than most clubs because genuinely, you know, every single partnership that we're trying to do, and this is a prime example of it, needs to be purpose-driven um, because if we're trying to compete against the bigger clubs in the, in the Premier League or on reach and, and scale, we're, we're going to lose. So we have to have a real point of difference. So um, absolutely just keep trying to grow it. Brilliant. So all we wanted to hear. Sadly, yeah, and I'm sadly I've run out, you know, the, the producer's in my ear. I don't know where the earpiece went, but it's telling me, <laughs> sorry, got to pull this together. Look, thank you so much, John, Phil, Thomas. Uh, not only for giving up time, but just being open, you know, being very honest. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the audience has really, really found it a, a great insight. I certainly have and really, really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, for us, from my side, thanks for being a great partner. You know, and again, that's the thing that, that's not changed at all. It's still like working with friends and family, work, working with, with the club. We all can now do things a bit different than perhaps we used to do. I mean, I didn't used to be able to get beer and wine on a table at one of these days, I tell you. <laughs> and for those of you who used to come for those sporting dinners out at the Concord Club, this is really posh. But that's going to show some of the hardcore fans who know some of those. Um, but for us, what the partnership does, apart from being able to you know, talk to friends, is, is the opportunities that it gives, gives our students at the heart. The opportunities that even hearing your insights do tonight, but it's those small things that uh, you, know, you, you come to us about opportunities, whether it may be small, small little opportunities in the club, through to the fact that you know, we, we helped work with you on some consultancy around the stadium, for example. That really helped a number of our business students. You know, that is that access to a Premier League club you, that is inspirational to our guys and that really, really is, is important and we really value that. So, so it's genuine thanks. Um, so I would then just like to say to thank all of you who have joined us uh, online. Um, I really hope you have, it's not that I'm not thanking those in the room, by the way, but after you've gone offline, I'll thank these. I didn't, just wanted to get that clear. Um, if you've enjoyed the discussion, Please, you know, do reach out. There are a number of my, my colleagues that, that are available in the university. There is, there, is, there is ways on the website. 
And if you want to know more about what we do at UWL, please, please do get in touch with us, and particularly what we do with the community. So if you're coming from a, a community organization, think we could work with you, just let us know. But again, if you're a potential student, please just get in touch with us. And a bit like Thomas, old-fashioned, pick the phone up, and we'll have a good chat with you and take it forward. So I really genuinely thank all of you for joining us tonight. I do hope you found it enjoyable. And I believe on that note, I will finally stop going on and we'll cut to the last video. Thank you very much. A couple man tried out I stand in but I still stand out So they call me S from West But the one I see teams go south Like how can the prey man's down And don't even have a good reason Yo, man try and move like Pickford Van Dyke been out for the season Who's Jardin again? Calm man's been out here clotting again They cut the mic and the father for them Got enough pick me on rot as a miss Had class for a start at a test Now I can't rest till it's A class in the race You want see stacks for a pass on the bed All love for the green when a man gets head Who you know about X's? On oh, mic man a donkey we you know about bounces, the old track get jumpy We you know about practice hours, sharp and skill when I'm rusty Had to go back to the mountains, fur on my face like a husky Tell a man trust me, I know my team Could have been times when a man don't sleep, chasing a dream There's no I in team, but why is it only I in the team? Get what I mean, Cut too many men move shady When I'm just trying to see M's on M's Move like Henry, got no eights, but smoke when I take off heads Can't be bad like we I can't tell when I'm out, I'll stop Cause I see I got bills on me Jumbo when I'm out, I'll see I got arm I'll sleep in the DNG Don't know that's karma, but I come back from what you wanna see yeah. Can't be bad like we The man can't Man, I want bills on me Shout out to the big and call him man, take liberty Don't know that's karma, but I come back from what you wanna see yeah. And I see that man ain't sturdy, I've been early, different time Bad vibrations swerved, they tried to assist but they moved off sides Bruv don't get ahead of yourself and you know my ting and you know my vibes They look at me like Marcus Rashford expecting a meal like why? Don't look at me with your hand out, this skill costs arms and legs, heart and chest If it ain't with it then I might get bench, most of these men can't share